Hello guys, this is Paul McWhorter from TopTechBoy.com and we're here today live, live, live with episode number 39 in our live shop talk. Are you guys ready to rumble? Just kidding, we're not really going to rumble. I've got to stop joking about that because I don't want you guys to start rumbling because as we talked about last week, way too much rumbling going on. But maybe one day when things will calm down, we'll just rumble just a little bit just for fun. Okay, guys, are you ready for this episode? Are you guys ready for a pretty cool episode? I'm actually kind of excited about this episode. And it's something that is something I do a whole lot of work in, but we, you know, I don't talk about a whole lot. So I thought it would be good to catch you guys up on it. And what the topic is, is sending instrument packages to the edge of space. And as you guys know, I actually teach high school and I have a group of engineering students that are, they kind of start with me as they are freshmen and I teach them their freshman sophomore, junior, and senior years. I teach the same group four years of high school. First year is engineering one, the second year is engineering two, and then their third and fourth years are the incredible space program where they design and build instrument packages and then send those instrument packages to the edge of space. We typically are able to get our packages up over 120,000 feet. And guys, at 120,000 feet, you're above the Earth's atmosphere. If you think that the pressure pressure at sea level is 100,000 pascals. That's 100,000 pascals. By the time we get up to 100 or 100, 120 or 125,000 feet, the pressure drops to about 300 or 200 pascals, which means <laughs> 99,800 pascals of pressure are below you and you are up in for all practical purposes, space. <clears throat> the pictures that we take <clears throat> from that altitude, you see the blackness of space. You're high enough that you can see the curvature of the Earth. Yes, you flat earthers, the Earth is <laughs> does have curvature man that is so funny anytime i put pictures up there it's like there's these flat earthers up there out there and i don't know where they come from but they just like jump in and start telling me how i've photoshopped the image and everything that everyone knows the earth is flat so flat earthers it's a little bit of kind of like almost a religious cult but no <coughs> I am firmly convinced from my own personal experience that, hey, man, we got a super chat already. Vene, Vene, thank you. Most generous. I'll tell you, I am going to be drinking only the finest coffees. Okay, so when we get to 125, 130,000 feet, we're really above the Earth's atmosphere. You can look. You can see the curvature of the Earth's surface, and also you see the blackness of space. And then around the Earth below you, you see this a thin blue line, which is the Earth's atmosphere, which is now down below you. And so I think that is just pretty cool. And I think it's really cool that kids in high school can design instrument packages and send them to space, uh, kind of like on their own, with a little bit of help and guidance from the old man here. So what I want to do is kind of catch you up. Uh, we have done 10 launches so far, and this has been over probably the last six or seven years. We used to try to get two launches in a year, but now as we've started getting more and more sophisticated in our instrument packages, we get one launch in a year. And last year, unfortunately, due to the pandemic and the shutting down of everything, we were not able to get a launch off. And so we are, chomping at the bit oh philippe my goodness wow philippe you are always the most generous and i am telling you when i pour myself a cup of coffee i think philippe hooked a brother up thank you thank you guys it really is encouraging to get the little the little super chats from you i do uh i do appreciate that thank you very much so 
I think it's pretty neat that the students can do this. And last year we didn't get a launch off, and so we are really excited to get a launch off this year. This year is going to be our most aggressive as far as what we're trying to do. And so if you guys are interested, let me just kind of catch you up on what we do in general and what we're trying to do this year specifically. And then if this interests you, maybe I could have one of the students come on and we could give you a little bit more, a little bit more of a you know working level student view of the package and what we are trying to do this year. So is this something that interests you or is it just I'm a crazy old guy that likes to send stuff to space in my spare time? Or would you guys like to hear more about this? I'm watching the chat to see if there's any interest because if there's not, I don't want to do this. That is fine coffee. That is really good coffee. Hey, Opal. Always good to see you here. Okay. Uh, okay, so Matras says it's good. Sumnil says it's interesting. Sounds like I'm getting a little bit of positive feedback. Philippe says that he would love this. Okay, Philippe, we are interested. Please do it. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, it sounds like you guys are interested in this. And so I I'm going to start by just kind of showing you a little bit of a view inside our program here of what we have done over the past. Again, we have had 10 successful launches so far where we've gotten to space, we've taken pictures, we have come back down, re-entered the atmosphere, and then found in, hey, Jose, man, thank you. Thank you, Jose. Wow, really appreciate you guys. So we've had we've had 10 successful launches, 10 successful recoveries. Actually, there were two that failed out of, uh, so we've had a total of 12 launches. 10 were successful by success, meaning went up, took pictures, came down, we found it and recovered it, and two were unsuccessful. One was unsuccessful because our instrument failed upon re-entry. Hey, Ehab, thank you, man. Look at that. You guys are just crazy today. You've been sucking on those generous lozenges again. You've been sucking on those generous lozenges again. I don't know what's got into you. But on one, we were using a commercial tracker, and that tracker failed on re-entry. And so the last thing we saw is we saw what its position was on re-entry at about 50,000 feet. But, you know, that was the last data point that we got. And so we lost that package. And then a second one, we basically didn't get off the ground because we bought the bottle of helium. But the bottle of helium was short on helium. And so we emptied the bottle, but we didn't have enough lift to launch. And at that point, there wasn't anything you could do. And so we sort of ended up, I don't know if the helium bottle had sat too long and had leaked out a little bit, but we didn't have the calculated lift and therefore we didn't have the desired helium. And that was a failure. But out of 12 launches, we have had 10 successes. And so let me kind of come in and show you what we do. Again, this program would be our third year engineering students, our third and fourth year engineering students. And so let me just kind of show you some of the pictures from the past. This is a little bit of a blast from the past, but we typically will shoot to launch at eight o'clock in the morning. We have to get uh, federal aviation approval for our launch. And so we have to be watching weather conditions like 24 hours before launch. We have to coordinate with the uh, federal uh, the, the Federal Aviation Administration because we will be uh, transversing those uh, commercial flight corridors. And so the commercial flights in the area have to be looking for our package so that they're not caught off guard and have a, you know, have a, have a balloon, you know, you know run into a balloon or something like that. So we got to kind of, we got to kind of give them a heads up that we will be doing this. But we typically will start for an eight o'clock launch, we will gather at about 5.30 in the morning. And this is a picture of mission control here, which is our control room. And in the space program, the juniors and seniors will probably typically have six or seven students that are actually formally in the program. But then we also invite the freshman and sophomore engineering students so they can feel a part of it and kind of motivate them to stick with the program. Alex, man, look at that. 
Thank you so much for your lessons. You are hard. Hey, man, Alex, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for the cup of coffee. Really appreciate it. But if we if we take the people that are formally in the space program and then the other just freshman and sophomore engineering students we will typically end up with about 20 students in mission control here in the classroom and you can see that there's about 15 or 20 desktop computers each one of those desktop computers will be displaying a live animation a live graphic which shows one of the data streams that we are shooting back from space and so each one of the displays will have a different thing that we're tracking, like maybe the downrange velocity, the vertical ascent rate, the altitude, the temperature, the pressure, the GPS coordinates, the like the the angle above the horizon that the package is, or the uh, heading that it is, the direction. And so we have a lot of data coming in, and there's live animations on each one of those computers. And then we have a different student monitoring each one of those and this is kind of our mission control then you see the green screen back with the lights and we typically try to do a live stream with a couple of the students so, so that you can tune in and watch the launch and so it generates a lot of excitement uh, there was one time I think we had a live stream there was something like eight or nine thousand people that were watching it and so that was quite exciting that day that we had a really really large uh, a really really large audience and so that that is showing mission control as the students are starting to gather uh, at about 5.30 in the morning. What they're doing is they're firing up the software, they're getting their algorithms put in place, they're getting everything running. And then another uh, group of students, everyone has a very specific job, but then some of the other students will go out to the launch pad and start preparing for the launch. And here, what you see up here is the instrument package with a string on it as they are getting ready to start the inflation process for the balloon. Always uh, the local news media, the local television stations, radio, uh, newspapers will come to launch it so you can see the cameraman there that is gathering some footage because they really give us very good coverage because it's not every high school that has a space exploration program so it typically gets a lot of attention. <clears throat> then back at Mission Control we'll typically <coughs> typically have a couple of students who are going to do the live stream so you can see them there uh, you can see them there in the studio this is kind of like the studio that I'm in now with the green screen back there and they are getting everything ready for their live stream and then we can go back out to the launch pad and this is probably at about seven o'clock in the morning you start the inflation process you can see the balloon it's very uh, you got to be very careful inflating these things you can't touch them it's very very easy to damage the balloon and so you know you've got to have kind of everything mapped out step by step by step and it's not just you have to have it planned that the FAA gives you like a 30 minute window to launch in and and so you have to start things and you have to go like clockwork to have everything ready to launch within your uh, within your launch window. So you can see the students beginning the inflation process there. And then here, as you get a certain amount of gas in it, you can see that there's a tube going in and filling it up. It starts to come up and sort of support itself and start getting a little bit of lift, as you can see in that picture. Uh, at launch the balloon is maybe five or six uh, it's maybe five or six feet in diameter and that's enough to lift the package I believe that we have a hard legal limit of four pounds on the package the lighter the package the higher that you can make it go but legally <clears throat> it can't be over four pounds and so that kind of creates an engineering challenge because you've got to get all your instruments all your power everything to fit within that four pound legal limit put by the FAA but you can see here it is getting close to being ready to launch and then once we hit that launch window we will have mission control who's in communication with the launch site out there we'll have them give the countdown and then the guys on the launch site will let it go and away it goes and so you can see it right there man look at that Devin what are you thinking, Devin? 
Wow, thank you for the super chat. You guys are so generous, and I swear I appreciate it. I enjoy fine coffee beans, so I appreciate it. Okay, so here you can see this is just a few seconds after launch. We, uh, I have, uh, hey, again, appreciate it. That is really, really, really kind. I appreciate you guys. You're very, very, very nice. Uh, so this is just a few seconds after launch. We shoot for a vertical ascent rate of five meters per second. Five meters per second is pretty fast, so this thing <coughs> goes up very, very quickly. And when you watch it, you very quickly are not able to see it anymore. I mean, it goes up fast. And this is another view. And what you can see here is you can see the parachute is the orange. Uh, and the parachute is sort of halfway between the lifting envelope, the balloon, and the instrument package that is down on the bottom. And then what you see dangling from the bottom of that triangle is a radio. It is a 2.39 gigahertz uh, one watt radio where we can live stream data and video from the instrument package back to mission control. And so this would be just a few seconds. This would be just a few seconds after launch. It is already well on its way to space. Now, part of the trick is, OK, so it's going to go up. It's going to take lots of pictures. It's going to send lots of data back to mission control. But at about, as you go higher and higher and higher, you have less and less atmosphere. You have less and less force making the balloon small. The higher you go, the bigger the balloon gets. By the time you get to 125, 130,000 feet, the balloon is about 40 feet across. And then it will go a little bit higher, and then it will burst, and then it will start re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. As it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, it comes down really, really fast because you're above the Earth's atmosphere, therefore you have no drag to slow it down. But as you begin to hit the Earth's atmosphere, it sort of starts slowing down, and finally you'll have enough air to uh, deploy this orange parachute then the parachute will open it'll slow it down and then it will begin drifting down between our launch to burst is about two and a half hours and from burst to touchdown is about two and a half hours and during that five hours we've got to be chasing it right because we want to recover it it doesn't do us any good if it goes up takes all this cool data and video and then comes down and we can't find it and so we have to be chasing it and so we have one of the coolest things i think that any high school could possibly have and that is we have our own ambulance which we have reconfigured with all types hey man want to eat pizza what has gotten into you guys? Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. But this is our ambulance, and it was donated to us by the most excellent Schleicher County Sheriff's Department. They gave us this thing fully decked out, and then we kind of undid it as an ambulance and redid it as a mo mobile communication center. We have about 14 ham radios in there. We have radios that can communicate with the uh, Department of Public Safety, the Highway Patrol, the uh, fire departments, the police, the, the sheriffs. There's all these radios that we can sort of be in communication with anyone in there, as well as having uh, HF long-range ham radios as well as the short range, you know, sort of local talk over the repeater. And so this thing is decked out with equipment on the inside. I'll give you a little picture of the inside here. I believe you can see it there. And you can see that box up there has about 10 uh, mobile radios on it, each one dedicated to a different channel, a different frequency, depending on who we're wanting to talk to. And then up uh, and then down below it, we have like a uh, who is it? A Kenwood, like a, a Kenwood T. What is it? A TS2000, a really nice long range radio. And so we are decked out with uh, with ham equipment in there. We also have uh, mobile hotspots and so we can communicate over things like Skype or uh, Zoom or whatever from the uh, from the ambulance back to mission control since it was an ambulance and we put all this ham gear in there we call it now a ambulance 
and so it's kind of neat it's got like lights and sirens and stuff and so sometimes we can like turn on the lights and sirens and so it's pretty cool for a high school kid to be able to ride in an ambulance with lights and sirens and things like that and of course we do that in coordination with our local law enforcement so it's not like we're out running rogue or something like that but yeah yeah sometimes the lights and sirens do come on and so that's showing you so we'll have a group of students on the launch pad we'll have a group of students that are the chase crew and then we'll have a group of students that are back in the classroom monitoring things and so there's a lot of different jobs we have and uh, you know, we sort of have different students with different levels of expertise to decide what they are going to do this is a picture of one of the things that we use back on the ground this is a 2.9 2.39 gigahertz antenna parabolic dish we have it connected to a uh, wi-fi one watt radio and then this connects with the radio on the package so that we can stream from space back to ground control now I'll tell you a little bit about why that is a challenge it's a challenge because again legally we are limited to we are legally limited to four pounds on the instrument package that we put in space <coughs> and that has to carry power okay that has to carry all the instruments plus power so it's not like you can put up a hundred watt radio and put a car battery on it all right because we are limited in weight that means we are limited in battery size and that means we are limited in power that we can send out through the radio. And so our radio on the instrument package is a one watt radio. The problem with just a general one watt radio is you would have about maybe a hundred yard range on that. And when we are 20 miles high and 70 miles down range, that's like a 90 mile hypotenuse. That's a 90 mile line of sight between our radio on the ground and the radio on the uh, on the uh, space probe and that's very very hard to get a signal when you just have one watt to work with so how do you do it well you get a parabolic dish and the the more gain that your parabolic dish has the easier it is to pick up that small signal but at the same time the larger the gain of the parabolic dish the more accurately you have to point it so if you get a very big dish that means you've got to point at that target within say two or three degrees of accuracy because if you're not pointing with that accuracy you absolutely miss it and you got to remember that as you are going through the jet stream as you are going through the jet stream this this instrument package might be going at a hundred and fifty miles an hour so you're trying to target a package that's moving at hundred and fifty miles an hour and is a 70 80 90 miles uh, miles down range and that is a pretty hard problem and so what this thing is it has servos on it, it has stepper motors and so you sort of know the position of the package you know your the position that you're at then what you do is you do a really complicated mathematical calculation called the haversine and then that will tell you what heading and what elevation you need that antenna to point at to be pointing right at that instrument package on its way to space it's a real hard problem okay we can do the math perfectly we know perfectly where we are we know perfectly where the package is and we know perfectly where we should point this is what impacts our ability to accurately point and that is the that is the accuracy of the sensor that tells us on this antenna what its actual tilt and heading is and that's done with a non-axis inertial measurement uh, uh, chip and those have a certain amount of intrinsic uncertainty in them and so basically the overall performance of the system is limited not by our math not by knowing where our position is but actually knowing what the elevation and heading that we actually have on that antenna is and that is what kind of limits how accurately we can point 
but we have been doing this for several years and we have actually gotten to the point that we were getting data back while it was at its apex of 130,000 feet. So we have streamed successfully live data back from space at 130,000 feet and some probably 90 miles downrange. Now once we get up to our apex of our flight, we take pictures and this is an example of one of the pictures that we took uh, at the apex of our flight and you can see the curvature of the earth down below. You can see the blackness of space. That is the sun against a black background. That's not something you usually see. You usually see the sun with blue around it. But here, since we're above the atmosphere, you see blackness surrounding the sun. And then if you look down right about here on the earth, you can see that thin blue line that is the Earth's atmosphere. That is the sky that is down well beneath us. And so I think that is pretty neat. Then also as we get at the apex of our flight, we can turn the camera upwards and then we can look. And here we sort of capture just about the moment of burst. And you can see that little white spot is a little piece of the debris coming off the balloon as it burst. That little orange thing is the parachute, and then uh, I that is another that white thing is another piece of the balloon that's coming apart. So we can actually take pictures as we reach the apex. Then it becomes it starts coming back down, and as it comes back down, this is actually a picture. This is actually a picture that our instrument package took after it landed. It actually landed in a tall tree, and you can see the students are trying to pull on the string to get the thing to come out of the tree. And so as they are trying to recover the package, the package is taking, uh, the instrument package is taking pictures of them trying to recover. And they did successfully recover. <coughs> and you can see here, after uh, after they have regained uh, regained control of the package after the approximately five hour flight. Now, what we do during the flight is I had indicated that we're constantly streaming all the data back to the classroom. We're constantly streaming all of the data back to the classroom and we're monitoring it and we're recording it. And as we're able to maintain the connection, we're also looking at the live video in the classroom from the instrument package. But we're also monitoring kind of like three things. We need to know where the instrument package is, you know, during the flight. We need to know where the chase crew is and then we've got to be in constant communication with the chase crew like we'll say hey you guys need to stop you're getting ahead of it or we need to tell them look it's getting away from you you got to go faster and so we are in constant communication with the chase crew trying to keep them on track to tracking the balloon so this is uh what we see back in the classroom and this would be showing the whole track of the balloon. So you see you get not just the latitude longitude coordinates of it, but you get the altitude coordinates of it as it's going up and as it's going down. And then on this same one, it doesn't show on this picture, but on this same one, we have a red track showing where the ambulance is. So in real time, we're looking at the red track and we're looking at the yellow track and then we're coaching the chase crew of where to go and they maybe need to get on a different road or they maybe need to take a different route so you've got guys that are calculating the route no no you guys get 190 190 you got to get to 190 or oh uh, there's a farm to market road there's a country road you got to cut across you got to get down here because we have a general prediction of where our flight should go and land but it never works perfectly so we got to constantly adjust our uh, our uh, projection so that the chase crew kind of keeps up with the uh, with the package now at first they can go a lot faster than the package can but when the package hits the jet stream at 150 miles an hour yeah we have an ambulance yeah we have lights and sirens but we cannot go that fast we cannot go that fast so it's very exciting as we give feedback to the chase crew to try to keep them up with it. Also in the chase crew in the ambulance they have this view on a computer there when they have uh, when they have good internet they can be watching this as well. Okay 
<clears throat> so let's see what else I have to show you here. That's kind of the that's kind of the pictures that I had put together. I'm going to take a second and I'm going to let you guys ask some questions about our space program. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the package that the students are working on right now. This year students are working on as they are hopefully preparing for a successful launch. So let's see if we have some uh, let's see if we've got some questions here. Jamie says, uh, very interesting. Uh, Panchal, was the camera live streaming? Uh, we do both live stream cameras from where we're we're streaming live video back from space and then we also have other cameras that are just recording and we can see those videos after we recover the package so we might have anywhere from two to five cameras on this thing okay Gerard says so cool it is pretty cool Jamie says clear good uh, love from India hey Pawar welcome thank you uh, okay hello sir what grade are your students my great my students are from ninth grade to twelfth grade and so twelfth grade would be your last year of high school ninth grade would be your fourth uh, your first year of high school uh, how much is the total cost okay the I would say probably uh, the launch supplies are about six hundred dollars so you got to buy a balloon you got to buy a tube of helium and that's your main cost you may be if you used a smaller balloon you maybe could do it for 250 or 300 dollars okay uh let's see johan says he's 66 and enjoys the tutorial okay greetings from the netherlands Johan, welcome that's very good to hear uh, if you look on my channel, there are some, look under Edge of Space or High Altitude Ballooning on my channel, and we've got some video from some of the other ones. Philippe, epic. Well, thank you. Epic is such a wonderful compliment. Really appreciate that. Which software programming is used for the various instruments and dashboard views? Our visuals are done with Python, and then on the instrument package, we have sometimes Arduinos. We flown Arduinos, we've flown Raspberry Pis, we've flown Arduinos with Raspberry Pis. On the Arduino, of course, it's Arduino, and on the Raspberry Pi, of course, the programs are Python. And I'll talk to you in a minute about the most excellent Jetson Nano that we're gonna try to fly, uh, fly now. Uh, how can a student from India do this kind of stuff? I don't know, I wish I could answer that. Uh, can you recommend a cheap thermal camera? There, I'm not aware of any cheap thermal cameras. Can you use AI to have less people involved? Interesting idea, visionary. I'll have to think about that. Philippe, do you measure magnetic fields? We have not done that yet. Uh, right now, most of our effort has been taking simple data like temperature, pressure, and positions and velocities, okay? And we haven't done a lot of scientific experiments. It's more about having a platform where you know where it is, where it's going, and you're able to recover it, and a little bit more of a focus on videos. How did you make the transition from engineering manager to high school teacher? Well, I just kind of like, I, I flourished in the high tech world i moved to very high corporate executive positions that's a really really high pressure job and at one point i just got tired and decided hey i'm gonna go do what i want to for a while and i retired i think i was 45 when i retired and then i enjoyed about six months of just rest and relaxation wanted to do something else and thought i'm gonna teach high school that is my story and i will stick to it uh, in general, what hardware on the payload? Well, typically we'll have a Raspberry Pi, a Arduino, we'll have some Raspberry Pi cameras, we'll have some GoPros, and then we'll have a 2.39 gigahertz radio, and that's and then we'll have sensors, a GPS, we'll have pressure, temperature, pressure sensors, temperature sensors, other sensors. <coughs> that's kind of how we do it. How you burst the balloon. The, the balloon bursts on its own. It keeps going up. The higher it goes, the bigger it gets. It finally goes one inch too far, and it blows up. Can you have a timer for the parachute so the wind will not blow it so far? That is an interesting thing, but parachute deployment is very, very hard. And if you don't do it right, if you try to get fancy and it doesn't deploy, then you are dropping like a rock from space. And that is a big, that's a bad thing. We had one flight where the parachute did not deploy. And let's just say that was not fun. Uh, 
<clears throat> no one has mistaken us for a UFO yet. Uh, can you talk more about the communication between the balloon and the main station? Well, we got a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi radio, your standard Ethernet Wi-Fi radio. We hacked it and reprovisioned it for 2.39 gigahertz because there is a ham band, there's a tiny little slice of ham band at 2.39 gigahertz. And since there's no commercial equipment at 2.39 gigahertz, that channel is dead quiet. You get no interference because no one's operating on it, which means when you're listening for that faint signal 90 miles away, there's a way that you can get it. But it's basically ethernet, Wi-Fi, over the ham band and that's kind of whoa gamer you guys are so nice to me you guys are so nice to me uh okay do we need a how do we design a directional antenna uh you buy a directional antenna now on the instrument package itself it's an omnidirectional antenna because it's fl it's flapping around in the jet stream it's got to be omnidirectional or you would never be able to point down to Earth. So it's pointing everywhere, but the one on the Earth is just a parabolic dish that we buy. And so in space, it's broadcasting everywhere, but on Earth, we are focused like a rifle on the, the, the signal. Okay, if that makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> how long does it travel? It's, it's like <coughs> it can land 150 miles downrange and the overall flight can be five hours. Uh, the next launch, we haven't set a date. We're hoping in the next month or two we will be able to do that. Okay, uh, giveaway. You cannot get a helium balloon of that kind, and these things are not even permitted to fly here. Okay, so, so it sounds like that this might not be possible in India. Could you launch a rocket at the balloon apex? People have talked about that, but that's really hard. And the problem is a rocket, like if you worked as hard as you possibly could, you could get a rocket that would go a few thousand feet. Remember, you're limited to four pounds. You could maybe get a thousand feet. Well, if you're at 130,000 feet, does it really make sense to go to a lot of effort to get one more thousand when you're already at 130,000? So we haven't tried to do something like that. Should have mission shirts. Yeah, we've looked into getting uniforms and stuff like that. It's just we've never gotten around to it because we've been so busy with other things. But we wanted to get kind of like really cool black jackets with like a cool logo on it and black hats and black shades, sort of a men in black theme we thought about doing that but we have not uh, ever done it is 130,000 feet legal limit no you can go as high as you want you can go as high as you want but it's just really really hard to go over 130,000 feet that is kind of it why is the legal limit four pounds well because if you're flying in an airplane at 600 miles an hour you don't want to run into something that weighs 20 pounds and so four pounds is small enough that in the unlikely event, oh man, RJ, RJ, man, you guys are so nice to me. You guys are so nice to me. This is beyond coffee beans today. Today, maybe I ought to be buying some launch supplies or putting this money towards a helium bottle or something like that. Uh, so anyway, that is kind of the history of it. Do you guys want to see this year's package? Do you want me to like open up the hood and give you a sneak peek of what no one has seen before, which is the most excellent Eagle 11? If you guys are not interested, I can just end it here. But those of you who want to see Eagle 11, better type in down there and tell me that I'm not just boring you here, that you actually want to see Eagle 11. King says, yes, SB, yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Visionary Robotics. Okay, you guys want to see Eagle 11. One thing is, this is, I think, our most professional package so far. <clears throat> it's the most sophisticated package so far, and I would also say it is the most high-risk package so far. So without further ado, I am going to show you, I'm going to reveal, I'm going to unveil the most excellent Eagle 11. Okay, so let's start kind of at the power. So this is the power cable and this would plug into a suitable battery. 
and then you know batteries are kind of like random voltages it's like some random voltage in the bat as the voltage goes down as the voltage goes down as the battery begins to drain and so then we go into this buck regulator with a nice big heat sink and so this is the arbitrary voltage coming in these two screws here set the output voltage and then we get the desired output voltage from these two wires which would be I do believe would be 5 volts then that 5 volts is coming over here and powering yes you guessed it you see it the most excellent Nvidia Jetson Nano now I'm not aware of anyone who has put a Jetson Nano into space before and so we do believe that we might be the first to try to put a Jetson Nano into space and then what you can see is the Jetson Nano has a nice long ribbon cable and then the Raspberry Pi camera on it now what I'm not showing here is <coughs> our plan is to have the Raspberry Pi camera mounted on a servo so that like at the first part of the mission the camera can be pointed down so you see you're leaving the ground and then maybe when you get to say 10 15,000 feet you could point the camera out where you begin to look at the horizon and you can see the blue of the atmosphere and then that blue gets smaller and smaller and then finally turns to black maybe you'd point down 45 to see that curvature of the earth as you start getting higher as you get really 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 high you want a few good pictures of the earth and the blackness of space and that thin blue line of the atmosphere and then what you would probably do is want to turn the camera pointed up so that you can capture the burst then on the way down you might point the camera back down so that you can watch re-entry and then actually come down and watch touchdown so I don't have that servo here just because it doesn't fit conveniently but you've got the uh, Raspberry Pi camera and it will be mounted to a servo now one of the things you see instead of having this these things just randomly connected together we've actually built a PC board the students built a designed and built a PC board and the Jetson Nano is firmly attached to the PC board and then what we have is the most excellent Adafruit GPS and a I think it's like a BMP 180 pressure and temperature sensor you get a lot of data off this GPS you get your altitude you get your latitude you get your longitude you get your downrange range velocity if you me measure your altitude over time you can get vertical ascent rate you can calculate how far downrange you are <coughs> you can calculate your downrange velocity there is just all kinds of data and math you can do with the signal coming off of the Adafruit now you don't want to just go buy a random GPS because there is a law uh, the uh, military sort of frowns on you doing home uh, cruise missile uh, experimentation and so they don't want people building their own cruise missiles so they have a law that these GPS's must shut down if you are over say 60,000 feet or 80,000 feet and if you're going more than 800 miles an hour it's something like that if you're going more than 800 miles an hour you uh, if you're going more than 800 miles an hour and you're more than 80,000 feet you might be a cruise missile and so they shut down the GPS <coughs> the problem is the law is written with with and that to shut down the GPS if you're both high and fast you've got to it's, it's legally you've got to shut down the GPS but the manufacturers of GPS always want to be cautious so instead of doing an and they did it with an or so if you're going really fast or if you're so high they shut down and so most GPS you get above 80,000 feet I think and the GPS will shut down out of Sam man what are you thinking Sam thank you appreciate the coffee Sam tip my hat to you okay so do you see the difference between and and or the correct interpretation of the law is only shut the GPS down if you are high and fast but most of the manufacturers of the GPS shut them down if you are high or fast which means if you're a balloon and you get high, they shut the GPS off and then you are 
flying blind. And so the, the Adafruit GPS is one of the few ones <coughs> that will go all the way up without shutting off. And so I hope that makes sense. So we get all that. We're getting pressure and temperature from the BMP 180. We're getting a lot of stuff from the GPS. Now we want to talk back to mission control. Now I told you earlier we were doing those Wi-Fi radios and we were doing the very accurate pointing of the parabolic dish back on the ground and we are not doing that this time. We are doing something a little bit different and I'll be honest with you is, is that we finally got frustrated that we couldn't point any more accurately than what we could measure the tilt and heading of that parabolic dish and that was limited by the accuracy of the non-axis sensors and so we got to the point we can't do any better at pointing because of the fundamental accuracy of those non-axis chips and so we went to a different approach this time and what we have here is a satellite modem you can see it has an antenna looking something like a gps <coughs> but there is an a a constellation of I think like 60 something satellites that are constantly surrounding the earth and the iridium constellation of satellites will allow you to communicate from any point of the earth to any other point of the earth it is 100 percent coverage of the earth so you could be on the north pole and the south pole and from those two positions you could communicate with each other through the iridium the iridium uh, constellation of satellites and so we have this satellite modem program to interface with those iridium satellites and so we send our data from the uh, from the Jetson Nano we send it over to the modem and then we give the command to the modem to send it to the satellites once it sends it to the satellite it can go satellite to satellite to satellite then it comes back to the earth and what it does is it hits a web server that we have and then we have a PHP file that creates a text file and then back in mission control we can just hit that PHP command and we can grab that data from the web server okay so it goes from Jetson Nano to the modem to the satellites to the satellites to the satellites back to a web server that we have on the ground and then in mission control we can hit that web server and we can get that data packet what is the advantage of this we can go 100 percent coverage anywhere on the face of the earth and we can get our data the downside of this is it is low bandwidth and so for this launch we are going to be able to we are going to be able to save our video and we're going to be able to see our data. We are going to be able to see our, our GPS and our sensor data in real time in mission control. But we will not be able to see the video live in mission control. So that is the little downside. But we're going to have way, way, way better data connectivity with this particular approach, <coughs> if that makes sense. And then so from launch uh, from the launch site all the way to the recovery site, we will have 100% coverage of exactly where we are, exactly what is happening. And then all the data from the cameras are going to be uh, are going to be stored. Now, we're not doing per se really artificial intelligence on this first flight. We're just trying to establish a flight platform that works. And then when it works, then next time we can look at doing fancier things with the computation power of the Jetson Nano. So let me, hey, uh, Opal Shirley says, let's see Eagle 11. Okay, well, here it is, Opal, you've got it. Okay, so let me answer, uh, let me ask you guys a question. When you get all the way up to uh, 100 and, uh, 120,000 feet, it can be a 120 degrees below zero. Okay, so what is your fear with the Jetson? With the Jetson, what is your fear when you get to 120,000 feet? 
and it is a hundred or 120 degrees below zero. What would you be concerned with? Put your answer down below and then I'll discuss it with you. Is anybody out there? If it's 120 degrees below zero, what are you worried about? Okay, you're worried about ice. <laughs> it misses Texas weather. Okay, that's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Let's see. Anybody else want to talk about what your concern is? The electronics will stop working, the cold temperature, the battery. Okay, a lot of good things. And so kind of like the answers that you guys are giving is, is that electronics are not designed to work at a hundred degrees below zero and so if you get there they could lock up and stop working because of the extreme cold because of the extreme cold right the answer is wrong <laughs> believe it or not your fear at the apex of the flight is not that it's going to be too cold and the electronics lock up your fear is going to be that you are going to overheat and burn the things up because of heat okay why is that so it's like completely opposite it's completely counterintuitive well let's look here what is this this is your heat sink the purpose of the heat sink is to get the heat that is generated by all of those 128 cores on the Jetson Nano get that dissipated so you don't overheat the Nano and it burns itself out. Well, what is the mechanism by which you get rid of heat? Well, you have a little air molecule. It comes in, it hits the heat sink, and the heat sink heats that molecule up and then it leaves much faster than it came in and it takes a little packet of heat off of the heat sink that's why you use a fan you're getting more air molecules coming in over the heat sink and carrying the heat off you carry the heat off with air molecules hitting <coughs> the heat sink and carrying it off when you go from a hundred and hundred thousand pascals at sea level and you go to 200 pascals at 130,000 feet, there are no air molecules. So it doesn't matter if it's 100 degrees below zero. What matters is there is nothing to transfer the heat off of this heat sink and dissipate it away. So what happens is if you're not careful, you're going to burn to death in an environment where it's 100 degrees below zero. Does that make sense? And so our fear is not that we need to keep this thing warm and we need to put a heater in it. Our fear is, are we gonna overheat this thing because we don't have any way to cool it and it's almost as if there's not even a heat sink on there. Did that make you surprised? Did you have, ah, somebody said water cooling. Okay, <coughs> the interesting thing with water cooling is the pump and the water and the radiator are all going to take weight and they're going to take power which then generates a problem with our four pound problem and also it doesn't really solve the problem because with water you can take the heat from here over to here but now this heats up and then when the water comes back i'm now putting hot water on it so yeah it's going to heat up slower but still the little radiator and the pump and all the liquid are going to come up to that temperature and that water is not going to be able to dissipate the heat away. And so you're just kind of moving the problem from one area to another area. Okay, I think King's mind was just blown. Okay, that's uh, that's interesting. But <coughs> when I actually worked on space programs, that was one of the big problems that we had in the vacuum of space. It was how to dissipate heat, even in the environment where you were very, very cold. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a few seconds. Let me know a few minutes to ask a few last minute questions. Would you guys look like me to bring one of my students in and maybe we could fire this thing up and show you some of our visuals and have a student talk to you a little bit about what we're doing. Are you interested? Are you interested or do you believe that you have heard more than you ever wanted to know about our space program? Waiting, waiting. Are you guys going to answer me? I know there's a little bit of a delay so once I ask it takes you a little while to answer. 
I wish YouTube would have a zero latency uh, broadcast so we could interact a little bit more. Uh, what if you use part of the fuselage as a contact point? Yes, I'm interested. It works on cold up to some range. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Okay, sounds like you guys would be interested in hearing more, and so maybe we can see. You know, engineering students tend to be kind of uh, introverts by their very nature but I'll see if I can coax one of them to maybe come on and talk about what they're doing I didn't actually build this you know I'm the teacher and the mission and the hardware and everything was defined by the students and I just sort of mentor and guide liquid nitrogen would be an interesting thing but then you're gonna have to liquid nitrogen you're gonna have to have a tank and that tank is then going to have weight. And if you just had an open vessel of liquid nitrogen, as the atmosphere gets thin, it's going to evaporate almost instantly. Uh, just wondering how fast do you type? That's a strange question. Thermal pipes and ammonia. Guys, there's a lot of things. It's just the cooling problem is a very, very significant problem because it's just like you, you know, wherever you're moving it to, everything's going to come into equilibrium at that temperature. And so it is a little bit of a problem. Okay, guys, I really like to keep these things under an hour, and we are coming up on an hour. I want to leave you guys. Uh, wanting more and maybe in the next few weeks we can try to get a student in here to talk about it and if you're interested we might try to live stream the uh, live stream the launch uh, you know again we're having a lot of trouble with the launch this year with all the COVID stuff everything is hard but we're really hoping to get a launch and maybe if there's interest we could try to do a live stream okay guys I've had a lot of fun today I hope that you guys have had as much fun watching this as I've had making it want to thank you guys that were so generous with the super chat really is an encouragement to me again this is your friend paul mcquarter and i will talk to you guys later